Here you're ready for your dose of reality. To the latest episode of the Dr. Quack Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Quack, and today the doctor is in. No, the doctor is not in because I'm still tr- I'm trying to straitjacket myself because I felt like hanging myself. This show sucked. Well, folks, you can understand this. Look, I, I am an East Coast man. He is a West Coast man. We both met down here in Texas. I am a huge fan of ECW. I love what they did. You do not like them so much. No, and you are now appropriately named. You are a quack if you thought this was worth watching. Well, it it was definitely interesting. This took place on August 3rd, 1996. It got aired there on August 6th. But it was take place at the Philadelphia U.S. venue there, the ECW Arena. A.K.A. the bingo hall that nobody else wanted to use. <laughs> and, and I guess we'll, we'll talk about this. We'll start right off by saying if you actually warp your brain so much that you go check this out on the Peacock Network, it'll say right off the bat there were some technical difficulties, so they aired the best at what they could. I wish the technical difficulties would have been we didn't get to see it at all. Well, I thought it was okay, but we're going to get into it because we had on commentary, we had Joey Styles. Oh my God, does he suck? Joey Styles is the independent version of the big name celebrity. He's not very good at telling the story, moving the story along, moving the plot along. But if you want somebody that can tell you what the moves are, him and Mike Tanay would have been a great comedy team. The only difference is I like listening to Mike Tanay because, oh, my God, if I have to hear that every time some 
fake ass high spot comes up, I want to shoot the television. God, he's so happy to do this show. And we had on ring announcing, we had Joel Gertner. We had Bob Artest. He was actually the ring announcer. We got the quint quintessential dud muffin out there doing one thing. And I'm praying for the day that we don't have to watch that guy ever again. You don't like Joel Gertner? Joel, no. squeeze my lemons till the juices flow. I can reach you from here. Feel the love on this. Yeah, and, and let's go into, <laughs> this is something that occurred during the early days of ECW. J.T. Smith, who was the guy that always they chanted you effed up at because he did mess up. He's one of the guys that started that chant, and now he would do it on purpose. He was Uncle Fred and a couple of others before they were Uncle Fred and a couple of others. Well, this time he didn't sing. He brought out some Kiss impersonators, which we'll get to that here in a little bit. Yeah, let's get into the opening match, shall we? Because no. the opening match was Mikey Whipwreck taking on Devin Storm with the godfather of ECW, Damian Cade, and Lady Alexandra. I I'm going to correct you just from the standpoint of this was the most notable thing that I remember. He's not the king of ECW. Extreme! He was the king of Extreme yeah, the Championship Wrestling, not ECW, because he corrected Bob Artest when that's he did right. that. That's right. See, we're paying attention here today. I enjoyed this match. This was a solid opener for me. For I mean, it was great to see Lady Alexandra out there. I mean, she was definitely beautiful. That definitely highlighted that she, match. She was a beautiful woman. And for this show, I guess this would be the best opener. Now, Mikey Whipwreck went from the lovable loser. He was the very first person trained at the ECW dojo that actually appeared on television. He wasn't the first one trained. He was the first one to train that appeared on television. And he became a big name there, taking on Devin Storm, who we reviewed before. He was in Bash of the Beach 2000. He was Crowbar. He had felt so good about a match, he took his own pants off. And Damian Kane, who is a friend of the Dr. Quack Podcast and Heart and Soul Promotion. So Damian Kane, we're going to give it up to you there. Thank you for, for supporting us. And his wife, Lady Alexander. Now, she was a fitness model, and, a, and I believe she was also a, a lingerie model or a fitness model. Mm -hmm. And uh, this match was really kind of sloppy. There was a lot of ghost moves happening. What I mean by ghost moves is they were jumping around and missing because they were aiming for the ghost. They were missing by so far, so bad. It, it, it felt more like a training show than it did an actual match that would appear in front of a crowd. But the crowd was kind of eh at this point. They kind of cheered for Mikey, but he really... Th this match didn't flow very well. I went one and a half. It was okay. Yeah, we're going to have a little bit of differences on opinion, I'm sure. But I went two stars on this. I felt like this was a solid opener. I enjoyed this match. You know, it's just... It's what you expect with ECW on openers. This is about their standard. Yeah, and, and since the referees, with the exception of one, have no any kind of history on them, this guy was Paul Richard. He's the big, tall guy with a stupid, dumb triangle on top of his head and the bad, bad weave in the back. Yeah, and moving along, we had Johnny Smith taking on Louis Spicoli. Now, uh, this match saddens me. I, I've seen these guys work in Japan. They had much better match than this match. I don't know what it was. This match didn't go very well. Louis Spicoli, who came to the WWF as Rad Radford, part of the Body Donnas, the inventor of the Spicoli driver, now known as the Death Valley driver, and also one of the very first guys that died in the late 90s into 2000s of drug overdoses. So, who knows what we could have seen out of a very talented guy named Louis Spicoli. Yeah. Taking on a guy who was a big name in Japan in All Japan Pro Wrestling. Not a big name here. Johnny Smith, the younger brother of Davey Boy Smith. This match wasn't thrilling. The moves were out of order. And what I mean by that is big, impactful moves were being done and then they put on a headlock. They, they were done out of order. You want your moves to progress and as they get more impactful as they move up. You don't want to start at the top and work your way down. That's not how it works. Uh, this was... I really felt like this entire show was two eight-year-old kids were playing a wrestling video game. I'm going to get the pile driver first, kid. No, I'm going to get the pile driver. I got the snap suit play. That's what this whole show felt like. It really had no rhyme or reason to why these matches occurred. But I went one and three quarter. At least it was a nice match. It was better than the first match. And you could see, as he says, 
setting the table. Yeah, I mean, this one here, I mean, again, I'm going to go probably two stars on this. This felt like the standard, like ECW, what they would do at the beginning of shows towards when it came towards the later end of them. Which this match, this match was okay. This wasn't nothing spectacular. It was technically okay, except yeah. for what you're talking about with psychology. But yeah, yeah and, I enjoyed it. And John Finnegan, who actually became a WCW referee for a very, very short period of time, refere refereed this match. Yes. And moving along, we had Axel Rotten taking on Devon Dudley. <sighs> this match is incomplete. This match never even started. At this time, Devon Dudley was feuding with Big Dick Dudley, who was actually who was supposed to be the patriarch of the Dudley family. That, by the way, patriarch means the father of all and everything down below it. And Axel Rotten, who had been feuding with the Dudleys all this time, now they're going to have a match, and it never happened because we got all a bunch of the other Dudleys. We got Big Dick Dudley coming down, Bubba Ray Dudley come down. Dances with Dudley comes down. Chubby Dudley comes down. Sign Guy Dudley, who was also Lou E. Dangerously. The only one we were missing was Spike. Spike and Dudley Dudley. Those were the only two we didn't see. Yay. I was so thrilled to watch this snuff film live and in color. Because that's basically all it was. It was bad chair shots. They were trying to hit each other with chairs. Because that's what ECW was known for. But this match never happened. And it even got so bad, Axel Rotten tried to grab Devon Dudley and get him the hell out of there. Yeah, I mean, the chair shots, for the most part, were okay. Devon, I, I didn't like it. Because when you got to take a chair, you're usually over top of your head and you're swinging. You're not coming from here and just... Like this. This does not work. This does not sell it. You got to give yeah. me the money, right? But I will say this because of what we know now about CTEs, he was hitting in the head with those light swings. So he was trying to take care of people. So I will give it up to Devon for that. That, that for, yeah. And it was incomplete. It was a good schmoz, just something to pass time on the show. I didn't have an issue with it. But yeah, we had Stevie Richards with the Blue Meanie. Don E. Allen, Lori Fullerton, Raven, Supernova, and Tyler Fullerton taking on the Sandman with Missy Hyatt. All right, so let's this get This was quality, wasn't it? No. Why? This was not quality. Why? <laughs> what about me? What about Raven? You know I can still reach you, right? <laughs> now I am... <laughs> so... We're going to go into a little history here. <laughs> ECW was a regional territory opened by Todd Gordon called Eastern Championship Wrestling in Philadelphia in 1992. Todd Gordon was still around, but he eventually sold it to Paul Heyman. So now they were, still, oh, they were only a regional thing until they had a couple of really, really hot angles that Pro Wrestling Illustrated noticed. The first one was the feud between Tommy Dreamer and Raven that lasted for a whole year, and it actually won Feud of the Year of Pro Wrestling Illustrated. This was the other one that got this no-count indie show national credit, which was the Sandman taking on Raven. Now, Lori Fullington was Raven or was Sandman's real wife. They were still married at this time. They divorced about four years after this. Lori Fullington was also a wrestler named Peaches. Yes. She, she was better off just being Lori Fullington. And Tyler Fullington is Sandman's real son. Yes. Raven was feuding with them, trying to turn Lori and Tyler against their dad, the Sandman, and eventually they did that. Tyler came out dressed exactly like Raven, did the Raven pose, and all of that. But that was innovative. I mean, look. It, it was. See, I, that's why I'm saying it was a very good story. Did you see somebody try to turn Ricky Steamboat's son against him? No, he was a baby when that was out there. See, you had to do this with a grown child. He was six. And it worked. It worked well it when did. he was standing over top of Raven when Sandman was getting ready to hit him. Yes, I, 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 I'm I, going to say, as much as I bash on ECW, the Raven-Tommy Dreamer and the Raven-Sandman feuds were well done. They were very innovative and very creative. I mean, did Raven ever have a bad gimmick? Scotty Polo there. Yeah, I mean, Johnny yeah, yeah, Johnny Polo was bad. 
No, well, I was a good manager. He did good for the Quebecers. Well, yes, because he's a great talker. Yeah, a great talker. Scotty Flamingo was a great gimmick. No. He won the Cruiserweight title, the light heavyweight title. No. Okay, well, anyways, that's... So, a anyway, so Raven has an injured ankle. He has an actual broken ankle. So, Stevie Richards, who, by the way, when I mentioned it before about Kiss, well, they're not the Blue World Order yet, but Stevie Richards, Blue Meanie, Donnie Allen, and Nova came out dressed as Kiss. I loved it. Yeah. It rocked. And, and this match, uh, Stevie Richards was taking the place for Raven, and this was an overbooked mess. Yes, the match was interesting. Yes, the story was interesting. The match was overbooked. It was really bad. It was hard to follow. It was hard to watch. I went two stars. Jim Otto, who should get more credit, did the refereeing on this match. I gave the two stars to the story, not really to the match. I liked it for two and a half. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you why I liked it. Because Raven had the psychology there. After hitting Sandman with the DDT, Stevie Richards tries to go for the cover, and he just pushes him off. He makes it claims his own. He gets that three count. I thought that was genius. Still an overbooked mess when you take into fact of Todd Gordon said that Stevie Richards signed a contract, so Stevie Richards was going to be in the ring, and then they had Raven. No. And the story and, was great. That was dumb. And we didn't really have Missy Hyatt involved much in this match. We're up to two and a half now. See, look. Big positives there. She wore, she wore a green dress, looked hot, and stayed out of the way. That, that's all she had to do. Two Cold Scorpio and Chris Jericho. All right. John Finnegan had this match. And this was a tale of two matches for me. These guys have worked each other a lot, especially in Japan. I didn't like this match all that much. This was not one of their... The first half of this match was a three and a half star match. The chain wrestling, yes. the false finishes. And then they decided to turn it from a chain wrestling match into a spot fest. And they were sloppy and they were missing. And then... Two Cold Scorpio's really ugly finisher. I thought he was going to hurt Jericho. He has hurt quite a few people, I imagine, with that. I've seen him land on people's heads. Yeah, we Chris Benoit, the very last one we reviewed. <laughs> yes. So while I'm going two and a half stars, most of that is for the first half of this match. The chain wrestling, as we've said, is incredible, and these guys were masters of it. Yeah, but the fans were into this match, though. They were. ECW fans were into everything, but they were into chanting their own names and the name of the company more than they were the fans. <laughs> they didn't get into the fans. They just wanted to chant their own names. I'm going to give it up to one more. I don't know his name, but the ECW hat guy. I'm going to give it up to the <laughs> ECW hat guy for two very important reasons. One, as far as I know, he never tried to hand anything to any wrestler he understood the boundaries. And two, he never touched the wrestlers. He stayed a fan. I wish more people would have been like ECW Hat Guy. There you go. Good job, ECW Hat Guy. I gave this match three stars. I was actually thinking this was a great match and this was worthy of being on television. It deserved to be on television, even though the last half of it was sloppy. But at least it was exciting. The botches, even the botches were somewhat interesting. That's why I went two and a half. But now I'm getting into my two finger salute. And this doesn't involve the participants per se. This doesn't involve Shane Douglas taking on Pitbull number two, who had Pitbull number one in the corner, and Francine on the other side. This involves the referee. This is what we talk about here. If you're going to have rules, which they didn't have a boatload of, why would you take a steel chain and hit him behind the referee's back twice, and then you have a steel chair in your hand right in front of the referee, and you whack him? Yes, you, you have to have consistency. Either there's no rules or there is actually rules, but there was no consistency in this match. The match wasn't horrible, but the referee really kind of just jacked this up. I'm going two stars. And this gets my two finger salutes. I, I actually, now that you say that, I think I've got a counter for that. Oh, God, here we go. Are you actually going to disagree with something when I gave it a two finger salute on ECW? No, I'm just going to defend. The referee on this oh. one. I'm going to defend the referee from one standpoint, and you've done it to me in the past, so it's my turn. By God. Chains are not part of the crowd. Like you see, you'd see chairs getting handed out all the time. Chains were not part of something that would have normally been in the arena. Neither is a roll of quarters, but Tully Blanchard knocked out MTA and behind the referee's back. That should count as a DQ if you're going to do it. It should, but I'm talking about ECW rules here. <laughs> 
Now, this was my match of the night at two and three quarter stars. Now, to explain what's going on here, there was a tag team called the Pit Bulls. And a couple of weeks before this, Pit Bull number one, a.k.a. Gary Wolf, which, by the way, please do not let Joey Styles ever say the word Gary uh, ever again. <laughs> but Pit Bull number one really did get his neck broken, and it was a true, honest, 100% accident. Because Shane Douglas went to DDT him onto the belt and the ring canvas slipped out from underneath both of their feet and he got spiked on top of his head. He does eventually return to wrestling about a year later. So he does have a wrestling career after this. And he's taking, and it's Pitbull number two, his tag team partner, Anthony Durand, who was the muscle bound meathead of the group. He really couldn't work. And this match was really unrealistic. I mean, you're right. Chain shot, chain shot, chain shot, chair shot, chair shot, and chair he kept shot. And just getting up bloodied and battered. And then it was a small package for the win. Yeah, that, that was pretty odd. So I went two and three quarters. I enjoyed the story. This is one of the few times starting at the top. Pitbull number two doing brain buster, doing a pile driver because they put over. They're trying to break his neck. So best time it made sense. I went two and three quarters because I liked the story. But in all in all, it really was a superhero fight. These guys did not know when to stop getting up. Yeah, moving along here. Brian Lee and Taz with Bill Alfonso and Team Taz taking on Steve Williams, Dr. Death, and Tommy Dreamer with Beulah McGillicuddy. Sit down, director. Sit down. I'm not going to make you put Mad Mountain Rock up there. You don't have to. I'm going to do it live for you. Reasons! What? What, why would you call this show The Doctor Is In and then put Dr. Death Steve Williams, an international celebrity, in the middle of the show? But it makes sense if you follow it. Why would you have not made it the main event if you're going to call it Doctor Is In? Well, we'll get Especially that. considering the title match, the heavyweight title match, was prior to this. Yeah, but there was, there was something different about this. There was a reason why the Doctor was in. We're going to get into that. But yes, we're going to talk about this match here. And this match, I, I enjoyed this match. I felt like th this was a good match there. I mean, there was a little bit of sloppiness in it. But, you know, for the star power of what it was, you know, it was nice to see Dr. Death out there doing his thing. You know, this is before he went back into the E in the, uh, the, the uh, tough enough, not tough enough, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, it was the Brawl for All. The Brawl for All, there you go, the Brawl for All tournament. Yeah, it was good to just see him on TV, that part there. But overall, yeah, I mean, Taz looked tough at five foot nine, didn't he? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I definitely <laughs> buy that five foot nine and 230 pounds is the baddest man on the planet. <laughs> uh, all we need to hear, actually, he, he speaks better than Mike Tyson. He's yes. still curly and still dumb, but <laughs> I went two and a quarter on this. Um, so let's talk about quick Beulah McGillicuddy, who in real life, is married to Tom Dreamer, Tommy Dreamer or Tom Laughlin. They've been married since 1992, and they're still married today. Good on them. Let's talk about Bill Alfonso, the walking, talking version of a whistle you want to shove up someone's ass. But he was a good referee. He was a decent referee. He was a god-awful manager. Like most other managers, he, didn't, he missed the point where you're not supposed to be the center of attention. <laughs> He was the center of attention. He was such a center of attention. Rob Van Dam used to whistle in his ear every time he blew that whistle. I wanted to choke him with it. Shut up. <laughs> but this match was a very disjointed mess. I mean, they went out and fought outside. Their, this, this is where road agents are very important. They fought opposite directions, and they had a director who couldn't keep up with what was going on. So you were missing half the action of both matches. The only thing that was nice, the T-bone that Tommy Dreamer took through the table. And then we get the national name, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, taking on the local indie talent, Taz. It really looked that bad. It looked like somebody who didn't know what they were doing. They were overwhelmed by being in that moment. And Dr. Death just made him look foolish because Taz made himself look foolish. At least the violence was fun. That's why I went two and a quarter, but I wasn't impressed. And moving along here, we had the ECW World Tag Team titles. The Gangsters, Mustafa and New Jack, taking on the Bruise Brothers, 
Don and Ron Bruce, we know them from many other places. The Eliminators, John Cronus and Perry Saturn, and the Samoan Gangster Party, Mac Daddy Cade and Sammy Silk. They were in handcuffs. I love this match. This was pure violence. No Fs given. This got actually three and a quarter stars for me because I just enjoyed all the blood, the violence, the weaponry, and everything else about it. I get this was my low rated match at one and a quarter stars. It was stupid. It was unintelligent. It followed again the same problem of everybody went all these different directions. The referee could not keep up, but neither could the director. The gangsters coming out with all that weaponry because that's all New Jack knows how to do. It's pretty bad when crazy ass Mustafa Saeed is the most talented worker on the gangsters. He wasn't bad. We get Rosie and Samu as the Samoan gangsta party coming out in handcuffs. And Rosie just about spiked himself headfirst on the floor. We got Jacob and Eli Blue from 1995 over there. Yeah. Five of the eight guys in this match are dead now. Uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot more. Uh, I wanted to have this really huge rant about this match. All I'm going to say is I absolutely hated this match. It was stupid. I never want to see it ever again. One and a quarter stars. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, you see how he's feeling about this show. But now we're going into the main event. The main event. And this is the reason why it was named The Doctors is In. Because you had Sabu and Rob Van Dam taking on each other in a stretcher match. Let me tell you, from a man who has been in a stretcher match, that is very difficult to do. There is a lot of carnage that happens, a lot of violence. Their goal is to knock your opponent out so bad that they get carried to the back. And that in this match here, it went roughly about 20, 25 minutes, somewhere in that area. But this match here was very strong on that point. The fans were actually excited on it. This match for me got three and three-quarter stars, my match of the night. And this is my quack attack. I don't feel the same way. Gee, this, shocker! <laughs> this match was dumb. I understand the premise. I'm fine with the premise. I hated the execution. It was god-awful. This was another one of those Superman taking on Superman. No bumps. They automatically get up. No selling all day long. They hit each other with everything under the sun. It was really god-awful. Sabu is an idiot because he tries to hurt himself on purpose. When you're doing acai moonsault and hitting your shin on the ring pole or the, the guardrail outside when you're missing your targets all the time. No, I've never been a fan of Sabu. I don't know how that guy's still alive, personally, as much as he's hurt himself. He's done a lot of Rob crazy Van stuff. Dam, believe it or not, gets better. He actually becomes a Hall of Famer. If this is his match when he's trying to show you why he's a Hall of Famer, he's not a Hall of Famer. At the very end, when he's like, no, no, move out. No, come back. No, move out. Come back. And then he jumps and crashes and burns on the stretcher. No, this match was dumb. And and the, the referees all standing around were really bad as well. They should have done it like you do with most stretcher matches. It's wrestlers, not the referees. This match... <laughs> Thank God it's over. One and a half stars. Yeah, that's right. The show is over. Yeah. Oh, no. Why? Why, why do you always say, oh, no, at the end of the show? I mean, because this was Because a, this you, was... you have a propensity, with the exception of two AWA shows and a couple of good WrestleManias. Dr. Quack is about reviewing bad things in wrestling, folks, and I have the feeling it's going to be that way again. Well, you know... This yeah. show was called The Doctors Is In. Doctor yes. Is In, right? Yes. I'm Dr. Quack. And now, on our next show, we're going to see Mayhem. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Our unofficial sponsor for the next show, Yingling!
It is. <laughs> oh, no. Look, that's my treat to you oh. because we did a show named after me. We got to do a show named after you. I'm Dr. Quack. <sighs> Besides Yingling, our other unofficial sponsor is going to be Tylenol. I'm going to need it. See you next time.